My name is Nadia Carlston. I lead product development at Sandbox. Um, at Sandbox, we are a company that spun out of Google uh, 18 months ago, and we focus on AI, and hence the A in our name, and quantum. Uh, and we are trying to bring those two technologies to make real world impact. Um, so we are not a quantum computing company, but it's almost impossible to talk about the impact of quantum without mentioning quantum computing, so I'll spend a few minutes on it. Uh, Quantum computing hardware has been advancing uh, pretty rapidly, I will say. Uh, quantum computers are coming. I think that's inevitable. Uh, but more to the point, useful quantum computers uh, are coming. So quantum computers that can actually handle practical applications, uh, I think, are getting closer. So two requirements for whether quantum computers are going to be useful. Uh, one of them is scalability of the architecture. Um, and the second one is quantum error correction and being able to implement that in a way that's efficient uh, in the hardware. So there's been advances on both fronts, uh, actually, uh, even just very recent developments. Uh, one of them from uh, my old team uh, at Amazon, uh, who just announced uh, their first logical qubit. Um, and there's been work in this direction uh, from Quantinium earlier this year, and this builds on the work that Google, IBM, and others had been doing on just increasing the quantity of, of number of, of qubits. But this is a really good direction uh, into actually getting fault-tolerant quantum computers, which are going to be useful for practical applications. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, we're all excited about quantum computing, uh, but it also means that we have to rethink uh, certain things, including cybersecurity. Uh, and the reason being that quantum computers will have an impact on the very foundations of how we secure data. Uh, so cryptography is really at the root of how we do that. It's at the root of how we store and how we transmit data and do that in a way that's, uh, that's safe. Uh, for example, uh, to authenticate, we need digital signatures. Uh, to maintain confidentiality of sensitive data, we do things like encrypt uh, that data as it's going across networks. And so all these things are things that now customers are having to think about with uh, a different perspective. Uh, the reason for that is a lot of our security relies on public key encryption. Um, and that was really based on the fact that some mathematical problems are very hard for classical computers to do, uh, like factoring very large problems. Uh, and that was great for a while. And then Peter Shore in 1994 uh, demonstrated that quantum computers could actually solve some of those problems fairly easily, or a lot more easily than, than classical computers. So now we have the issue of if those problems are no longer intractable, then the protocols that are relying on those problems to be hard uh, to, to be secure are no longer secure. So we're having to think about um, taking protocols like RSA, elliptic curve, and, and others that have been around for 40 years and have been the basis of security, and trying to figure out how to move beyond them. So at, at Sandbox, we've been working with customers on this issue of moving to this post-quantum cryptography, cryptography that's going to be more resistant to quantum computers. And we've been working on that since the, the very beginning, uh, helping customers migrate to that. But as we were having those conversations, we also realized that cryptography is actually a much bigger problem than just post-quantum cryptography. And what we found was that a lot of organizations had issues with managing cryptography more generally. Uh, had issues trying to figure out when and, and where to implement the, the right cryptography and finding out where the vulnerabilities actually were. Um, so our product uh, to answer uh, this need uh, is called the Sandbox CQ Security Suite. Uh, and this is an end-to-end -end, uh, set of tools that basically helps uh, companies identify, manage, and then remediate uh, cryptography across of their network. Uh, so the first step is for them to do a full inventory of any vulnerabilities, anything that is going to be risky uh, across their, their networks, uh, including things that will be outdated when quantum computers come, but also things that are already outdated, maybe, or just encryption that is incorrectly implemented. Um, and the key here is completeness. Uh, so we're able to provide full visibility by being able to uh, inventory across networks, but also across applications and file systems as well. And this sets customers up for success for the next step, uh, which is remediation. So in that step, it's basically how do we take some of these vulnerabilities that we found and start to remediate them? How do we find warnings of things that were out of policy and then make them um, uh, policy compliant, for example? 
So we've been working on this for a while. We had our full launch of our security suite at RSA earlier this year uh, in April. Uh, we've been working with government customers as well as commercial customers. On the commercial side, uh, we're working a lot with financial uh, services. Uh, most of the top banks are our customers. And we were also really excited uh, to get a contract with DISA, uh, the, Defense Intel, uh, the Defense Information Systems Agency. Uh, and we're working with them along with our subcontractors, uh, Microsoft and Deloitte also to move to uh, post quantum. We've also working with um, telcos, uh, including Vodafone. Uh, so this was a really interesting um, work in trying to figure out how does post quantum cryptography impact real life uh, telecommunications uh, use cases, which is something that telcos have to start worrying about. Um, and then in August, we also released uh, Sandwich, which is an open source uh, cryptography um, uh, library. And the advantage of that is it helps uh, developers actually be able to move from one uh, encryption protocol to a different encryption protocol much easier, which will help fix this issue of lack of crypto agility. So moving on to the second uh, trend that we're seeing, and this one is really driven by the advances in classical hardware as opposed to the advances in quantum hardware. So we all have this intuition that quantum computers are going to be uh, really good at simulating a complex system uh, because yes, quantum um, systems are easier to simulate by quantum computers. Um, and that's great, but in the meantime, can we actually use advanced classical uh, hardware to do some of this work and understand complex things like molecules and how they interact in, in a way that is better? Um, so here, GPUs have, have really been uh, one of the things that have changed uh, the way that we look at things and the way that our customers look at things. Uh, they are really reshaping the computational landscape. And when we think of GPUs uh, today, it's still primarily um, thinking of GPUs as being able to handle very uh, heavy uh, workloads, for example, for training and, and running uh, AI algorithms. Uh, but some of those attributes that make them really good at running AI workloads also make them very good at running quantum uh, algorithms. So we're seeing this trend where GPUs are more and more used uh, to run uh, quantum simulations as well. And um, this has really been driven by, by a few companies, NVIDIA being uh, the, the key, uh, in my opinion, because they have been able to make uh, processors that are really powerful uh, that researchers can use uh, to run very complex uh, problems on those processors. Um, so we're also really excited uh, that we've partnered uh, with, with NVIDIA, and we've announced this very recently, and we're going to be uh, working on them to run some of our uh, tensor network uh, workloads on, on their uh, hardware. So that's really exciting, and we think that that work uh, in doing these types of simulations is going to be uh, a key to solving some of our customers' challenges. Um, so simulation is a tool set that has a lot of different applications. This can be useful for a lot of different industries, uh, for a lot of different types of customers. In life sciences, it's pretty obvious that being able to simulate very complex uh, systems is useful, since a lot of biology is complex systems that we have to understand at a very molecular level. Um, but also being able to do better chemical simulations, better chemistry simulations, is also very useful for discovering uh, new types of materials, uh, including in the fields of battery designs, for example, um, and in areas that we don't typically think of, I think, uh, as scientists. Uh, finance and logistics are also heavily impacted by uh, advances in, in the way that we can do optimizations, uh, uh, especially a little bit of simulation, but mostly optimization. So doing things like predictive analytics and um, streamlining operations is something that a lot of customers in that space are interested in. So we're working in many different applications, but one of the ones that we've um, focused on since the beginning has been drug discovery. And the reason we focused on that is that it's such a big problem and that even with all the advances in computing, all the new techniques that, it, that exist, uh, there still hasn't been a lot of improvement to the fundamental issue of how long it takes to go from a small molecule uh, to something that is FDA approved. Uh, so this is a very 
um, costly uh, process. It's also something that takes a lot of time. Um, and another issue for uh, customers that we talk to in this space is that not only does it take them a lot of time, but there's a, a huge opportunity cost if they are focusing on the wrong compounds uh, for a long time, uh, because that means that they're not focusing on compounds that could actually be successful uh, in the end. So that, that's a huge problem. And so from the beginning, our um, goal has been to take these tool sets of quantum and AI and apply them to, to this issue. Uh, one of the case studies that I want to mention is our work uh, with UCSF on neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Uh, so this was an interesting use case because the team was working with a binding site uh, that is incredibly large and incredibly complex. So they had tried different types of simulation methods. They had tried basically all the computational solutions um, that are you know, standard uh, in, in the industry and they were not getting anywhere. And that's pretty common for uh, molecules and, and targets that are incredibly complex because as, as they get larger and more complex, there's more quantum effects and it's just harder to simulate. Um, so our approach was to provide them with a custom pipeline that included both classical as well as quantum approaches. Uh, and we found that generally um, this approach of combining classical machine learning techniques as well as physics inspired methods like tensor networks uh, tend to work where the traditional methods don't work. Um, so very exciting work and we're going to be looking at additional use cases uh, using similar approaches. Uh, we've also been doing similar things uh, in the battery space. Uh, so we've announced a collaboration with Novonix. Um, this one was really interesting because what we're trying to do is develop uh, prediction models for uh, life cycles of, of, of the battery. This is a huge problem uh, because customers need to know when and why batteries are going to fail, if, especially if those batteries are integrated into different products. Um, but it's actually really hard to do without doing it experimentally, which as you can imagine is very uh, costly and not exactly efficient. Um, so the key here is that we're able to make our models accurate enough and do it just based on early cycle data um, and, and be able to apply that, that model uh, throughout the, the life of the battery. So that, that was uh, really exciting work um, and we're continuing to, to work on this with Novonix. So last but not least, um, the third way that quantum is making a very uh, practical impact uh, today on different applications is through quantum sensing. And I probably will get on my soapbox and say that uh, quantum sensing doesn't get as much attention as it deserves, but when we talk about quantum sense, when we talk about quantum today, one of the first things that people should think about is quantum sensing rather than quantum computing. Um, the advantages of using quantum sensors uh, largely are focused on being able to do very sensitive uh, measurements of, of, of different types and, and being able to combine the precision that we're able to do, uh, be, be able to get with quantum hardware, being able to combine that with advanced machine learning methods to actually be able to focus on signals that we want is really the, the key to the advancements that we've had in this space. Um, so there's different types of measurements uh, you can do with quantum sensors. At Sandbox, we focused on magnetometry, uh, measurements of magnetic fields. Uh, within that space, there's a lot of different applications. Uh, there's uh, biosensing is an application that has really advanced. Uh, we can also do chip scale sensing. Uh, today, I just really want to mention um, ge geosensing and using that for navigation. The reason we've used we decided to focus on that is um, GPS is a huge problem. The reason it's a huge problem is that it's so ubiquitous. Uh, almost everything relies on it. And um, it's become really apparent how unreliable uh, that system is. Uh, it, partly because it can be spoofed, um, it can be uh, disrupted uh, at, in times of war or conflict. Um, and then it's also really hard for commercial systems that are reliant on these systems to, to, to be able to operate when, when the system goes down, in addition to the geopolitical uh, issues of, of having GPS go down. Um, so because of that vulnerability, um, it, it's important to look at, at alternatives, but there's also other reasons to look at GPS alternatives, uh, including the fact that GPS just does not work in certain environments, including underwater, uh, but also in cities. Uh, GPS signal tends to be pretty unreliable uh, when there's a lot of tall buildings. 
Um, and then in the future, of course, with autonomous systems, um, not, being, not having to rely on GPS is, is going to be an asset as well. So our solution uh, has been to look at looking at the Earth's magnetic field uh, as a signal and using that for navigation rather than rely on GPS. And the reason we can do that is the Earth has a magnetic field um, and the Earth also has a crust that is full of magnetic material. And that magnetic material is pretty randomly distributed uh, on, on the crust, so it creates a sort of fingerprint. Uh, so you can get these magnetic maps that tell you precisely what the magnetic um, map, I guess, of, of different places uh, is, is going to be. And using that information, um, looking at the reading from a quantum sensor uh, of what that magnetic field is, comparing it to the map, uh, actually gives you a location. Now, you have to do a lot of uh, denoising and calibration in order to get anything useful out of that. And so that's really been the key of what uh, our work has been at Sandbox, is creating those models uh, to denoise uh, the signals and be able to take um, that map and be able to extract a very accurate location, um, a very accurate uh, position that you can rely on. Um, so we have been doing this work uh, with uh, the US Air Force, uh, Air Mobility Command. Uh, we were able to put our sensors on their plane. Uh, we, we, did, we did these tests on a C-17 plane, which is a very large uh, transport plane. Um, and these uh, test flights uh, give us a lot of data. We're able to get a uh, magnetic uh, signal to be able to uh, determine location. So that was a really good field test. Um, and on the commercial side, we've also been working with a couple collaborators. Uh, we've been working uh, with uh, Boeing. So we were part of the uh, field test that the Boeing uh, DCN team uh, announced uh, just in September. So we were able to participate in a test that included multiple types of, of quantum sensors, and we were able to use the, the data from those test flights to advance our systems. Um, Jay Lowell from Boeing has actually given a talk on Thursday, so you should definitely uh, join that talk and learn more about this uh, really cool project and, and some more details about the, those tests. Um, also excited to announce that we have a collaboration with A-Cubed. Uh, so A-Cubed is the innovation center uh, for um, Airbus. And so they've been really great collaborators uh, as well. And we were able to also use their planes uh, to test our devices. So we were able to fly our uh, quantum sensors on their plane, gather more data, and also iterate on our machine learning models to be able to get the, the, the accuracy of our uh, position uh, even even greater. So there's a lot of benefits uh, to, to this approach uh, for, for navigation. Uh, we've seen that we have benefits both for uh, government customers, uh, defense use cases where they're really more worried about uh, GPS-denied environments and, and what that means, but also on the commercial side with our uh, commercial collaborators that are interested in the safety angle uh, as well as future-proofing uh, their systems towards autonomous um, autonomous systems. So I will end here because that's a great um, example of something that's going on today that is uh, practical. Um, and uh, I will take any questions, I guess, at the breaks. I'm here throughout the entire conference. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.